During the next half hour, we'll see relics of popular saints and hear from experts about their significance. And we'll talk to Cardinal Blaise Supich about why Catholics celebrate the commemoration of all the faithful departed. Welcome to Catholic Chicago. The Archdiocese of Chicago is a vibrant and diverse faith community. We celebrate our faith through worship, evangelization, and reaching out to the needy. Welcome to Catholic Chicago. Hello, I'm Todd Williamson, Director of the Office for Divine Worship for the Archdiocese of Chicago, and I'm here in studio, as always, with Cardinal Blaise Supich. Cardinal. It's good to see you again. Good to be with you, Todd. Thanks. Thank you very much. Say, right before we uh, started filming, I read your most recent column in the Archdiocesan newspaper, and you wrote about the upcoming celebration of the commemoration of All the Faithful Departed, or All Souls Day. Two great days in a row, right? All Saints and then All Souls. That's right, and I think, uh, as I noted in my piece in the Chicago Catholic, I, I wanted to... Um, make sure that people understand that the church sets aside an entire day yeah. in prayer for those who have died. And that's not just some t a moment on the calendar, but it really is an invitation to uh, understand that the communion of saints we celebrated the day before also includes those who await the fullness of redemption and that uh, there really is an obligation on our part uh, out of love to pray for them. You focused a lot on love. You focused on God's love and you focused on our continued love of those who are departed. Yes, uh, and it, uh, it came to my attention that people didn't understand what we believe as Catholics in terms of those who are yet not fully uh, in the vision of God with, uh, with uh, a full redemption, which we call purgatory, mm -hmm. uh, they understood it sometimes as punishment, and a, a group of young people did. So I tried to, as I said in the story, tell uh, uh, a story that would be um, in some way related to them, or at least put it in their terms. And, uh, and I think that it did make the point, although it was uncomfortable for the <laughs> young lady. It's a great story, by yes, the way. Yes, yes. So I don't know if you want me to tell it or have people read. The, ah, the, <laughs> a teaser, a teaser. <laughs> well, I, it, was, it was a discussion I had in the classroom of, of, uh, of high school students about purgatory. Yeah. And so I kind of just uh, decided that uh, I was going to get them engaged in the conversation by turning to a young lady in the first row and t complimenting her, telling her that she was a very special person. And she blushed mm -hmm. as I wanted her to, as I intended, because my point was that there's something in each one of us that um, does not want to hear the good things about ourselves, that, that we are not lovable, uh, that holds us back. And Purgatory is that, uh, for me, is, is that experience of God trying to convince us that he does love us, that we are lovable, that, that we don't have to hold on to the darkness in our life, and that we can let go of that. And as soon as we do that, something very liberating happens. And that's really uh, the redemption that takes place. Uh, it, it gave a whole different spin to uh, purgation, purgatory, for young people because they could understand yeah. that there was something in them that made them doubt their goodness. Mm -hmm. And many times when we doubt our goodness, we act on that doubt. Yeah. And we, we allow evil to come into our hearts. Yeah. We have to let go of that. God made us good. Yeah, but even that, that whole image I, I think is just terribly profound. Uh, the, the purgatory is, is God loving us into right. holiness. Right, and it is. It's the light that uh, comes and casts out the shadows of darkness. Uh, that has always been, that's why Jesus calls himself yeah. the light of the world. Yeah. He comes in to cast out the shadows of darkness in the world and in our lives. You end the, the, uh, the column and we can end this segment with it, but uh, I think a great line. You wrote uh, for us, those who were reading it, pray in a way that expresses what we believe and reminds us who we are. So a good message for All Souls Day. Right, and I also said that people should pray in a way 
that uh, gives the impression that they're really telling the deceased mm. of their love and also realizing that those who are deceased should hear God's love. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you talk about the whole idea of people not understanding purgatory and that was part of the message in the, yeah. in the column, but a, a different subject, but uh, another thing that I think many Catholics m might have some misunderstanding about uh, are relics. And recently in Chicago, we had uh, two tours of relics mm -hmm. come through, the, among others, uh, relics of St. Uh, Padre Pio and St. John Paul II. And in fact, uh, the Office for TV and Radio uh, met with some folks mm -hmm. who took part in those tours. Let's take a look. Okay, great. This is uh, St. Ida Parish. We're on the, uh, the far north side in Edgewater. Padre Pio is among the most popular saints in the church today. I mean, he's a contemporary, he died in 1968. He's remembered for uh, so many miracles attached to him. I mean, healings by location, uh, reading souls, but most especially the stigmata, he bore the wounds of Christ. Uh, he was a Franciscan friar, died in 1968. Uh, and actually founded a hospital. I mean, so sometimes we think of him in purely miraculous terms, but in fact, he was very concerned about people's problems in this world as well. His, his healings were um, often of very poor people. And so he's, when you think of Padre Pio, think of service to the poor. The saints are part of the mystical body of Christ. They're part of the family, right? They're our family in heaven. And uh, like any family, we have things that remind us of those who have died and gone to heaven. I mean, we have canonized saints like Padre Pio. We have a saint like my mother who was uh, not canonized, but I, I save things that remind me of her and they're a way of kind of connecting with her in a sense. And so for those people who have great love of Padre Pio, it's a way of uh, coming to a, a deeper communion with him. The relics are, are, are a collection of relics that are very personal to Padre Pio. Um, there's um, the, a glove worn over his stigmatized hands. There's actually a crust from his wounds. There's blood, there's hair. Uh, there's a, a handkerchief that was used to wipe his brow as he was dying, and also part of his Franciscan habit called the mantle, which is a, a cape that goes over the, the capuche or the hood. I think, too, it, it's a reminder that the saints were actual people. I mean, sometimes we think that, uh, you know, they're kind of these ethereal beings that were always in heaven, but Padre Pio uh, dealt with everything we dealt with, you know, temptation, you know, over, overcoming uh, the urge to do things that weren't holy, uh, giving in to those things and going to confession himself. I mean, he was a human being, but now he's a saint in heaven, and when they, we pray, all of us would be there. If Franciscan parishes, it would, one of our great um, missions has always been hearing confessions. There were times in the history of the church where certain sins could only be forgiven by, you had to go to a Franciscan church to go. And so Franciscan churches always emphasize confessions. So when we came here last year, the first thing that we did was add confessions every day and twice on Saturdays. Padre Pio spent hours in the confessional and any event that's dedicated to Padre Pio would involve confession. And then finally, when we think of Padre Pio and, and, and mercy, you know, it, it's in the confessional that, that God gives us his mercy. It's, it's within the context of, of the, uh, the church and its sacraments. And so to, um, to celebrate the life of this Franciscan priest who was so dedicated to that aspect of our charism uh, really uh, mandates uh, having two, we have two confessors all day. Well, today we have the honor of being able to welcome the uh, relics of uh, His Holiness uh, St. Paul, John Paul II. It's an opportunity to get closer to our faith and meditate on the beautiful life that was John Paul II and how close he was to Our Lady. That um, pushes on forward to, to continue to build the church and to re-evangelize the world. That's what she's calling us to do. The saints are part of the church. They're the church triumphant. And we're coming forward to the month of November now. We'll celebrate all saints. And uh, so I think it's important that um, that we venerate not only the saints, but the relics of the saints. And uh, this is important. God works many miracles through relics, you know. Um, he, he works, uh, if you read many of the miracles that went forward for the beatification of certain saints, it was through the relics that they happened to touch them. And so on this unique day, I find myself in the sanctuary of Our Lady of Guadalupe in this plains in Chicago with the relics of the saints which are available and people can venerate them. I have a first class relic containing the hair of Pope St. John Paul II. I have a first class relic containing the hair 
of Mother Teresa of Calcutta and there's a relic containing the heart of St. Jean-Marie Vianney, who's the patron of all priests. And we have the relics of the children of Fatima, three of them together, which is quite rare. I'm happy to see that people will come because this is part of the faith. And I know there'll be lots of graces here tonight, lots of blessings. The whole world very much had a very close relationship with John Paul. He, would, he was the first missionary pope. He was always out of the Vatican, always out wanting to touch people. And so this is kind of another way that John Paul II is with us. Is with us, uh, they, they say the saints are not far away from their relics. And so John Paul II is with us. So it's a very honor um, that I have to be able to celebrate this Eucharist. But more than anything, it's a time of healing for our country. It's a time of healing for the world, especially in times where there's been earthquakes, there have been hurricanes, there's been wildfires. There seems to be so much concern in the life of the world. And, Having a moment like this, it's kind of shot in the arm saying there is hope and God is with us. And the saints in heaven are always at the help of the church on earth. And that's the major message. Well, both great turnouts for, for, for both uh, of those um, experiences of, of venerating the relics. How, how would you talk about the cult of relics for modern-day Catholics? Well, I, I think that uh, they really did emerge in the time when people, as we do today, want to have some sort of link with people. Yeah. Today, we're spoiled by the fact that we have photographs of people. That's our connection. It's a visual connection. We live in a visual world. They didn't have that in the past. Yeah. And so that aspiration to really be in contact, in touch with the past, those people that we admire or who were dear to us uh, is something that uh, was played out uh, in a time when they didn't have photographs in, in the keeping of relics mm -hmm. and the keeping of various uh, pieces of cloth or uh, books that they had or even uh, parts of their own body uh, mm -hmm. that's then de uh, decomposed the, 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 uh, the actual bones and so on. So I think that uh, we today forget that we have contacts with people in the past by, by photographs. Um, I just saw the other day that there's a, the, a photograph uh, uh, of uh, the first, uh, oh, the, the, uh, one of the early presidents, John Quincy Adams, was taken in the early really? 1800s. Really? And here, you know, we, we, we see this emerging just in the 19th century. We're talking just about 200 years ago yeah. out of the whole history of humanity uh, that we've had uh, photos. So I think that uh, our aspiration today to be connected with the past was lived out in a different way in those earlier ages yeah. with relics. And, and it's really about, the, you said connectedness, uh, relationship. It's, it's really about connectedness or relationship to that particular saint. Right? Exactly. And I think that it, to keep fresh in, in one's mind that, uh, that individual, especially if there's a cult of devotion to that person, mm -hmm. uh, that it, uh, it allows uh, a nearness yeah. Uh, for that, uh, for the, for that prayer to take place. Yeah. Yes. So it really isn't macabre. It really isn't morbid. It's 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 really an act of faith and an act of prayer. Well, it is. It's like going to a cemetery too. I mean, there is a uh, sense in yeah. which a tombstone can be a relic as well. You mm -hmm. know, uh, it's very interesting if you go to cemeteries, older ones particularly, and you look at the uh, and you look at the names and the dates of people. Of course, you see that their lives were lived in a shorter period yeah. than we have today. But it's interesting to look at uh, how uh, uh, people in the past were memorialized through these tombstones. Yeah. That's a kind of a relic too because it, it's a reminder, it's something that remains as the word relic uh, uh, suggests. Uh, of that person for us to connect with. Yeah, yeah. Two great opportunities for yes. the people of the very archdiocese, much, very right? Much. Right. Kind of, I want to switch to a, a, a different topic. Uh, just a few weeks from this taping, you are going to celebrate uh, at Holy Name Cathedral. You'll be part of a celebration between Roman Catholics and Lutherans, commemorating the uh, commitment that was made between Cardinal Bernadine and then Bishop Hicks. Uh, between the, the two churches. Uh, talk a little bit about that. What's well, the commitment to? What's the Well, it's important in this year because we have here the 400th anniversary, I mean, the 500th yeah, anniversary, yeah. I should say, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. 
And uh, this, it seemed to be the right moment to mm. make that commitment uh, a more vibrant, vital, and uh, something that we uh, embrace uh, in a more fervent way. So we've been looking for ways, uh, opportunities to, to mark the, uh, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation in order to, uh, in order to do that, and this is one of them. Mm. So it, it really is our commitment to uh, do everything possible to respond to uh, the prayer of Jesus the night before he died, that they may be one. Yeah, yeah. And this is really a local manifestation of a universal covenant, isn't that correct? It Between is. the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church in the, high, in, the, in the highest levels. That's right, exactly. And the Holy Father, of course, has been involved in this throughout this year. Mm -hmm and um, has urged us to look for opportunities for that. You know, we have a very robust uh, ecumenical dialogue we going do. on here in, in Chicago. We have a, a, an office that does a wonderful job, a good staff who, uh, that works in a way that uh, brings about unity, not only among Christians, but also among other faith communities. We have great relationships mm -hmm. with the Jewish community, the Muslim community. Um, and, and that is it is needed even more than any other time I think in our world where we have such polarization. So uh, it, it is up to leaders of faith to come together and set an example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to to that end, uh, prior to the liturgical procession, I know there will be a procession of um, uh, of, of representatives, one Catholic, one Lutheran, from parishes where there already is a connection and they work together and right. they minister together. Right, exactly. And that that's, I think, a very uh, imp important, you know, you can do this wholesale thing between uh, the cardinal and the local bishop, but it has to be retail as well <laughs> uh, at, at, the, at a level so that it really does penetrate into the lives of, of everyday people. Yeah. And I think what will be significant is that you and Bishop Miller will sign not a new commitment, but a, a recommitment to the one made between Cardinal Bernadine and Bishop Hicks in 1989. Yes. So a nice renewal. Nice it is. Renewal. It's a great renewal. You know, another recent celebration at Holy Name Cathedral was a mass with the ministries for anti-domestic violence in the archdiocese. And Father Lou Camelli was a celebrant and the homilist, and we have a recording of his homily. Let's take a listen here. Great. If you happen to be an abuser, God's word, as we heard it tonight from the prophet Ezekiel, speaking in God's name, says, repent. Jesus in the gospel says, change. The abuse that we inflict on each other is an evil. It's a sin. It calls for repentance and repair. And if that is your situation, you can change with God's help. And the church stands with you on that journey of repentance and repair. If you have experienced abuse or violence, take heart. In faith we know that is not what God wants for you. That's not part of God's plan. You deserve respect. You deserve dignity. And sometimes it happens that people who suffer violence and abuse, sometimes in a kind of way of reasoning, use religion, maybe to even justify what's going on. It's a matter of just putting up with it. But listen to God's word tonight especially that second reading from the letter to the Philippians, Paul says, Jesus gave himself, emptied himself, sacrificed himself. Self-sacrifice, yes. Self-giving in love, yes. 
But never, never self-destruction. The Word of God tells you, if you have been abused, that it's not right, you deserve more, and you need healing. And the church stands with you, walks with you, prays with you, reaffirms hope. And if you are not an abuser, or if you're not a person who has experienced abuse and violence, you are here, and you are part of this larger family of faith, and you need to know the struggles and the sufferings of your brothers and sisters. You need to walk with them. You need to pray. You need to put them in God's hands. You need to do whatever is necessary so that people can live in peace as God wants them to. It's a, an important ministry in the Archdiocese for sure. anti-domestic violence. We've talked a little bit about it, but talk more about the, the importance of it. Well, as um, people who were present for Father Camelli's really very stirring and beautiful homily uh, can tell you, um, it is a way of making sure that people understand that uh, um, domestic violence does happen more mm -hmm. often than others would imagine. And it doesn't happen just in communities that are stretched economically or um, have uh, other social challenges that are there. Uh, it happens across the board in society. And I think it's important also to realize that uh, uh, domestic violence is not just only about violence, it's also about dehumanizing people. Mm -hmm. It's about, um, uh, in many ways, uh, pushing down people uh, in order for an individual to have dominance over another. And th that really is uh, something that uh, scars an individual, that they live with. They, they, it affects their self-worth, sense of self-worth. It, uh, it also, uh, within a family system, uh, creates uh, a model for behavior for children when they see adults solve problems this way. Mm -hmm. So it's a very it's very important to make sure that we understand the system of violence that's created by domestic violence. That it also has an impact then on society because people who experience violence in the home will act out in society as well. Uh, and it's very clear from statistics that uh, much of the violence we see in society started in the mm -hmm, home. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that we address this. It's very important that we name it and not shy away from it but give people some real help. Yeah, yeah, and and our archdiocese has uh, a quite solid ministry for anti-domestic violence. It does, and many violence. parishes have uh, many parishes have their uh, domestic violence committees, and look for ways in which uh, people can get help. Help f for not only in terms of being victims, but also help in being perpetrators, that they recognize the yeah. signs in themselves that can turn violent. Yeah, and then can act on that to get right. help so that it doesn't happen in the first place. That's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cardinals, our viewers are gonna leave this conversation now because our final story is a collection of stories about people and events that contribute to our vibrant, vital, and proactive Catholic community. Here's Al Castillo with a trip around the Archdiocese. This edition of Around the Archdiocese features a few very notable anniversaries. The Archbishop Quigley Center celebrates its 100th year. Featuring a French Gothic revival design, Quigley is considered a hidden jewel in the midst of Chicago's Gold Coast. The Quigley Center includes a large courtyard as well as St. James Chapel, and it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. It was home to a high school seminary and is now one of the two main office locations for the Archdiocese of Chicago. On the day we record this video, St. James Chapel plays host to a mass in celebration of the 125th anniversary of the Archdiocesan newspaper, originally called the New World, in honor of the World's Columbian Exposition. The newspaper covered major events over the decades, including the Eucharistic Congress, the Our Lady of the Angels school fire, 
and St. John Paul II's visit to Chicago. Now called Chicago Catholic, you can enjoy its stories in print or online at chicagocatholic.com. And more than 400 couples crowd into Holy Name Cathedral for the annual Golden Jubilee Mass, celebrating 50 years of marriage. Cardinal Blaise Supich is the main celebrant and homilist. All of this here today is for you. Just as it was on your wedding day, when a special time, a place, and circumstance was prepared just for you, and you were the center of attention. And the message for you to take away today is that there are many who appreciate all the many sacrifices and the difficulties, the challenges that you face to let you know, to bring home, that God himself has watched over you in those moments in which maybe you thought you were all alone, adrift, left to your own resources, in which you struggled with the conflicts, the difficulties, the challenges that were there. Today is a loud affirmation that as this local church is with you on this day, the Lord has been with you every day since you promised your lives to each other. That is why we gather here today to say that loudly and clearly so that you are encouraged and that your celebration can be one in which you take heart. During the Mass, the couples renew their wedding vows that they originally recited in 1967. Finally, the Super Stadium Challenge enjoys a super finish as students from St. Viator School in Chicago and Ascension School in Oak Park help bring donated food into a Catholic Charities warehouse. Archdiocese of Chicago Catholic Schools teamed up with Catholic Charities and the Charles Tillman Cornerstone Foundation to collect enough non-perishable goods to put at least two food items into every seat in Soldier Field. About 140,000 food items were collected to help feed the hungry throughout the Chicago area. This is Al Castillo with a trip around the Archdiocese. Let's remind viewers that the videos you've seen in this program and hundreds of other Catholic videos can be seen at our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Catholic Chicago. They wrecked the challenge. They made the challenge. Terrific, they isn't had. it? You know, it shows you the goodness and the generosity of young people that we should never be afraid to tap into. So I, I'm proud of our young people. A piece and of, in every seat in that stadium. Yes, that's, that's it, fantastic. It is remarkable, but uh, it is also something that uh, I'm not surprised about. Nice. Great, great way to end the show. Great way. Yes. It's always good to be with you, Cardinal. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks so for much, your time. Todd. Thank you. I'm Todd Williamson, and we'll see you next time on Catholic Chicago. We invite you to watch segments of Catholic Chicago and hundreds of additional Catholic videos at youtube.com forward slash Catholic Chicago. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter.